Thank you for joining us. My name is Susan Evans, and I welcome you to our webinar today. Kensington Senior Living has seven unique communities, four located in Virginia, Maryland, and New York, and three sister communities located in California. Kensington is truly privileged to support caregivers and professionals from coast to coast. We focus on relationship-based care, care built on the foundation of our promise to love and care for your family as we do our own. That promise was what initially drew me to become a member of the Kensington family, as my father lived at Kensington for almost seven years. It is programs such as the one you're attending now that are so important for those of us walking through a caregiver journey to hear from expert professionals on keeping us current with the latest advances in care, management, and treatment of conditions that affect seniors and their families. Did you know that Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological disease? Today, you will hear from movement disorder specialists from Cedar sinai and UCLA for an engaging discussion about the latest treatment that are improving the lives of those living with Parkinson's. You will learn the basic science, motor and non-motor symptoms, dementia in Parkinson's, the success of a multidisciplinary approach, and medical and surgical treatment options. If you're new to the Zoom platform, this presentation is in webinar format. This means your cameras and microphones will remain off and muted throughout the presentation. We will have a live Q&A at the conclusion of the presentations. Each of our attendees today will be receiving a recording of this webinar, along with links to connect you with Kensington and our presenters. Please share with friends and family. Allow me to share a few words about our first presenter, Dr. Jeff Bronstein. He is the Director of Movement Disorders and Professor of Neurology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Jeff received his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and MD and PhD from UCLA as a recipient of the Medical Scientist Training Program Award. He completed a residency in neurology and a fellowship training in movement disorders at UCLA in Queens Square in London. He also completed a postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology before becoming appointed director of movement disorders program at UCLA in 1996. Professor of neurology in 2006 and professor of molecular toxicology in 2007. He directs a basic science laboratory investigating the causes of Parkinson's disease, environmental and genetic. His clinical interests include the medical and surgical management of Parkinson's disease, Wilson's disease, and other movement disorders. Dr. Bronstein's active research program includes clinical trials to develop new therapies. That is impressive. Thank you, Dr. Bronstein, for joining us. And to our audience, you're in for a treat today. I will see you after your presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks for such a nice introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of the basic science of Parkinson's and really focus on uh, what, how, what we think causes Parkinson's and how this um, uh, leads to the disease. Uh, I was asked this morning when I was seeing a patient, you know, why do you do that? Why, why is it important? And it's important because we can hopefully avoid people from getting Parkinson's by avoiding some of the uh, uh, things in the environment that increase the risk, but also we can target therapies in the future um, because one size may not fit all and we'll target it by mechanisms. So that's uh, uh, why we do what we do ultimately to find better treatments and, and uh, make it a disease of the past. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen and get going. Um, so, sorry, I'm gonna, um, as you just heard, it's, a very, it's, a, it's actually becoming more common. It's a, approximately a million people in the US alone have it. And it's increasing with time. And the increase in time means it must be something in the environment as opposed to genetics because um, there's no reason to think that there are, are new genetic causes um, uh, coming up 
So I think that's a clue that the environment may be important. And it's a, as I think everybody that's uh, here today knows it's a huge burden, not only on the individuals, but uh, society, um, both um, uh, in uh, pain and suffering, but also uh, in dollars uh, spent or lost. Um, with, with new therapies though, people now live a, a much, uh, essentially a normal lifespan uh, and a much higher quality of life, though we have um, still ways to go. So let's start from the beginning here. Um, we always talk about Parkinson's disease by dopamine, and I'm going to talk about dopamine right now, but I want to stress, and I think some of my colleagues are going to really go into this much more detail, that it's not just a dopamine disease. Uh, it affects many aspects of the nervous system, but dopamine itself is um, one of the um, uh, signatures of the disease. So if you look up here on the top right corner, this area right here where I'm circling, it's called the substantia nigra. It's right in the midbrain. So you can see um, exactly where it is. And if you cut, make a slice like this, you can see what the brain looks like. Um, these are fresh brains, and then and a person without Parkinson's, you see this black substance here shown by the arrow, um, and that's the substantia nigra, or black substance, and in, in a patient with Parkinson's, you can see it's much paler, um, as shown here on the right. Um, these neurons actually connect to a different part of the brain, and they release a chemical called dopamine. And dope and neurotransmitters or these chemicals are the way our neurons communicate with each other. So an electrical impulse will come moving down this neuron from left to right. And instead of uh, touching this neuron here to let the electrical impulse um, continue to the next neuron, it releases a chemical in this little space called the synapse. And that chemical then binds to proteins. And so um, this impulse then can continue in the neighboring neuron. So these are the neurons. When you hear about dopamine neurons, these are the ones we're talking about. And these are the ones you can see with all the arrows and everything. That's where a lot of our treatments uh, for the symptoms um, uh, work through. Though others I, are going to talk much more about that. So if you zoom in on a dopamine neuron, this is what it looks like. And you can see here this darker substance. That's the pigment that, that, makes, that tells us this is a dopamine neuron. And this here, this little pale area, is abnormal. And that's called a Lewy body. So you can see a normal neuron down here. There's no Lewy bodies, but you can see this pale thing. And this is what defines Parkinson's pathologically is uh, um, is this Lewy body. Now, when I started in this game about three, 30 years ago already, we had, this is about all we knew about what caused Parkinson's. And we didn't know what this Lewy body was made of. Um, and now we've known, we know so much more, which I'm gonna go give you about uh, 30 years of research in 10 more minutes. So the clues that have come uh, that really have made a huge impact on the speed of discovery has been genetics. Now, most people don't have a genetic form of Parkinson's. Only probably about 5% of total Parkinson's disease can be um, thought of as a normal genetics. We call it Mendelian genetics, either autosomal dominant or recessive. Um, so these are incredibly rare, but they've given us great insight because we can figure out what these genes do. So the very first gene here, so again, all of these genes, there's actually some others that aren't listed, make up less than 5% of all Parkinson's patients. Um, so the first gene that was found in a very rare family is called alpha synuclein. And um, you've probably heard this name before, but it really came from this first genetic um, uh, family uh, that uncovered that alpha-synuclein is central to Parkinson's disease. So 
we can make an antibody to alpha synuclein and then stain um, the uh, neurons. And sure enough, this area in brown now, this is the Lewy body, and you can see it in brown showing that the Lewy body is just chock full of synuclein. And in fact, it's a lot of synuclein compressed there. And it wasn't only in that family, but in all the other people that have Parkinson's non-genetic forms, that Lewy body was there in over 95% of all patients. So turns out that this, that alpha synuclein um, was one of the important clues in trying to understand why some people get Parkinson's disease. And we now know through animal models and all other reasons that um, that not only was that mutation uh, causing the disease, but the mutation leads to the formation of Lewy bodies and the rest of the clinical characteristics of Parkinson's. So this, this is um, a cartoon uh, that summarizes years of research, molecular research. Um, so these little blue lines here, that squiggle is supposed to represent native or just normal alpha synuclein. It usually is floats around by itself, doesn't have a whole lot of structure. It binds to the, the little vesicles that um, have neurotransmitters in it and probably helps regulate the release of it. And uh, that's just thought to be its normal function. But when you have... Um, uh, mutation in that gene, or if it's uh, under certain conditions, um, it misfolds. And when it misfolds, it starts clumping up. And then you get these clumps that we call oligomers um, uh, or aggregates. There's many different names, but some of these clumps are very, very um, toxic to the cell. And there's many ways that it's toxic, which I won't go into, but when you have too much of this, we know it can injure the neurons and they can die. They also can form these fibrils, which are what happens um, to make up the Lewy body shown here. So the other huge breakthrough came from uh, 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 somebody from UC San Francisco who won the Nobel Prize who discovered um, a concept called prion or templating. And basically what we know is that misfolded alpha synuclein shown by these red blocks in the, down, in the right hand corner is when that is misfolded, it can actually make a, a normally folded one, turn it into a misfolded one. And then when enough of them get misfolded, they clump up and cause these aggregates or the oligomers and then eventually fibrils. So it can propagate itself. And it turns out it actually spreads. So this process likely starts for the majority of people in the GI system, the gut, or in the olfactory bulb, which is um, where we smell. And why that's important is if we look back 20, 30 years ago, before somebody is diagnosed with Parkinson's, so somebody gets a little bit of tremor, if we look in their GI tract or in their olfactory bulb, they actually have Lewy bodies there. And that is associated with some subtle constipation and, and a loss of sense of smell that precedes um, the diagnosis by decades. And what we think happens is that this, these aggregates, say from the gut, can then um, uh, follow the vagus nerve, get into the brainstem, and then misfold, release from one neuron to the next, and spread very slowly over a course of decades uh, to different neurons throughout the nervous system. Um, this is called the Brock hypothesis, and I won't go through this all, but there's actually a, a very classic pattern that most, not, but not all people follow um, uh, the pathology. This is just showing the gut um, uh, staining of a gut versus a nuclein in somebody uh, the colonoscopy had done five years before they ever had any inkling that they had Parkinson's disease, knowing it was there way before the disease uh, was noticed. 
One really interesting study um, was many years ago, some of you may remember that before we had all these uh, great drugs for ulcers, they used to do what's called a vagotomy and cut the vagus nerve for severe ulcers. And it turns out that if you do that, it lowers your risk of getting Parkinson's disease by 50% presumably because it doesn't have that route to travel into the nervous system. So just a, uh, some evidence that this process not only can happen in animals, but happens in people. So um, I've already stated that, uh, this, if, um, that it, this process takes decades. So if you think about it, this is right in the middle time zero is when somebody has the first tremor, first stiffness, or maybe they drag their leg a little bit and they go to the doctor and diagnose Parkinson's. But all of this process has been going on for decades. Um, the constipation, the problems smelling, maybe even a little bit of um, urinary frequency, having to go to the bathroom more often, et cetera. And as things go, have some sleep, maybe screaming in the sleep and acting out dreams, even depression. And then eventually you figure out, hey, all of that stuff was actually due to Parkinson's brewing. But until you get a tremor or stiffness, we didn't know that it was causing it because everybody who has constipation isn't going to get Parkinson's disease. So we had many other genes that can cause um, uh, Parkinson's mutations, they're very rare, um, but, we, uh, but they've instructed that there may be many ways of getting there. And we think that this um, aggregates um, of alpha synuclein are necessary to cause uh, the cell injury and death, and we can get there in a variety of ways. So we have different pathways, whether it's the uh, powerhouse or the mitochondria, which makes our energy in our cells, whether it's oxidative stress from free radicals, um, or whether it's problems degrading proteins, especially um, aggregates. And there's evidence that all any one of these or a combination of these can eventually uh, lead to Parkinson's disease. So what starts this process? Um, and uh, the answer um, is similar. It, it's pretty simple. We're all there. People are genetically vulnerable to certain things in the environment, and if they get those environmental exposures, that can trigger it. So it's this combination of gene environment interactions. So it's it's thought to be a very some people have a very fertile ground, genetically um, determined. And then there's many things in the environment that affect risk. So this is one of the things that I spend a lot of time uh, doing is trying to figure out what are the things that increase and decrease risk and how does that happen? So I just wanted to state that again, only about 30% of Parkinson's disease can be explained by genetics. Even though I said just a few minutes ago it was 5%, well, about 25% can be normal variations in normal genes, so ones that many people have, but they may, those differences which make us all a little different, um, may give a slight increase or a slight decrease in risk. Um, and if we add up all those, we call them polymorphisms and the genetic forms, it's probably somewhere around 25 to 30% which means the rest of it uh, must be uh, environmental. And the fact that the pathology starts in the, in the gut or the olfactory bulb also gives us a clue because that's how our bodies are exposed to environmental toxins. We either breathe it in and inhale it, which is a pathway to the nervous system or through the gut. And then the gut uh, connects to the nervous system through the vagus nerve. And in the gut, there's all kinds of ways that it can get in there. It can affect the microbiome, the bacteria, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about. So to summarize kind of where we are in these risk factors, um, we know that age, the, the older you get, the, the uh, bigger the risk of getting Parkinson's. Um, males get it almost twice as often as females, which we have no idea why. Um, smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, and drinking coffee actually have a, a lower risk of having Parkinson's disease. Um, 
we, if we have time, I can talk a little bit about the theories with this. I don't recommend people to start smoking or drinking too much um, uh, because it's probably not protective, but it's just, the association is real. The things that increase risk are things like head trauma. It can be even mild head trauma over time increases the risk. Exercise decreases risk by quite a bit, as well as a Mediterranean diet decreases risk. There's been a number of studies now that have shown people living eating a Mediterranean diet for years reduces the risk by 50%. Um, pesticide exposures, very specific ones, definitely can increase risk. Uh, air pollution, increased risk, certain solvents, um, trichloroethylene um, is, is a hot one, but other ones probably do it as well. So this is, some, this is uh, where we are. Sorry about that. So when I think about what causes it, it's the accumulation of all these different risk factors. And when people reach a certain threshold, and, um, they get the disease. And all these different bars represent different risk factors, whether they're genetic or environmental. So in the end, I just want to conclude by saying it's... Um, it's slowly progressive. It takes decades for it to, to form, which gives us challenges to study, um, but we're getting there. And the rare genetic forms are giving us really good clues on um, what pathways to study. And now we have a number of things that we're finding that are avoidable and things we can change in our environment, such as pesticide and air pollution which should reduce the risk and uh, hopefully reduce uh, the um, progression. Um, and many of these can be modified. So I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I think we're gonna do questions at the end. Is that Wait, correct? You, you know what, that was such a phenomenal presentation. And I just wanted to reiterate to the audience that you will receive a copy of this. I think a lot of people were trying to take notes really quickly, but everyone will receive a copy of this webinar to share. But I have one question about the gut. Um, and that is the Mediterranean diet. We all know that's very good for you. Do you think supplements for gut health would also be something that would be important to add to reduce the risk? So we're still learning about the microbiome. We're actually doing a big study on this. I'm driving out to the Central Valley just to study our patients again. Um, the answer is we're not sure, um, but what we do know is there are microbiomes that we think are better, less inflammatory. I didn't talk about inflammation, but that's a contributor. Um, and But taking probiotics does not seem to change the microbiome. Um, you can take all the probiotics you want and you measure the gut microbiome, it doesn't change, but prebiotics do. And what prebiotics are, are the food that the, that the bacteria eat. So that's why probiotics don't work. If the right food isn't there for them, then they're not, it's not going to take, um, uh, take hold. So some of the prebiotics, they do sell prebiotics, but honestly, the things that work best are fiber, a high fiber diet. Um, low in red meat and saturated fats uh, and processed sugars and lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Berries, for example, are all um, prebiotics that really um, uh, promote a really healthy, diverse microbiome, which is what we all want. And, you know, we keep hearing the common thread here is what's good for your heart is good for your head. So... Um, I think the Mediterranean diet is, is something definitely. So thank you uh, so much, um, uh, Jeff, for that wonderful presentation. And we'll see you in a few minutes at the Q&A. Uh, next, hold on for one second. Our next presenter is Dr. Michele Tagliotti. He's the Director of Movement Disorders, Professor of Neurology and Vice Chair of the Department of Neurology at Cedars-Sinai. His research interests include the study of early and advanced therapeutics of Parkinson's disease, dystonia, and other movement disorders. Dr. Tagliani pioneered the use of deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's, and his work contributed 
advances in the definition of outcome predictors and therapeutic settings of DBS. He is currently involved in research on the role of non-motor and motor mechanisms in the pathopsychology, oh, I said that wrong, pathophysiology of Parkinson's. Can you please join us? Thank you, Susan. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and thank you for having us uh, here today. Like Jeff, I'm gonna try to here share my uh, screen. Let's see, here we go. I hope that you can, can you confirm that you can see it? Uh, yes, I can see it. Very good. So uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you, uh, Jeff, for the um, amazing summary. It's, uh, I can tell you all that it's very challenging to summarize the various uh, uh, theories and hypotheses on the causes of Parkinson's disease in 15 minutes. So a great uh, kudos to Dr. Bronstein. My job is relatively simpler. Uh, because uh, I'm going to share with you what we know, uh, and it, believe it or not, is an evolving knowledge, as Dr. Bronstein uh, mentioned briefly, about uh, the presentations, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Let's start from the very beginning. Um, Parkinson's disease is named, as many of you, I'm sure, are uh, aware, uh, from uh, Dr. James Parkinson, who was a a doctor and a, uh, a neurologist, I guess, um, uh, in England uh, over 200 years ago. And uh, he famously described uh, a few patients, I think there were six, some of them, the story once were observed from the window of, of his office walking uh, on, on Hyde Park in, in London. And he described a common series of, of, of symptoms that he observed and he described them as involuntary tremors motion with less than muscle power, in parts not in action and even when supported with a propensity to bend the trunk forward so they had a stoop uh, posture and to pass from a walk into a running pace, the senses and intellects being uninjured. Uh, the, he called this the shaking palsy, as you can see from the title of his, uh, <clears throat> of his book, an essay on the shaking palsy. And then the, the definition was uh, slightly uh, uh, refined by a French neurologist, Jean-Marie Charcot, in the late 1800, which added uh, the slowness of movement and the stiffness to the shaking, to the tremors and ended up calling it Parkinson's disease to uh, exactly honor the initial um, description of, uh, of Dr. Parkinson. And uh, just to entertain you with, uh, with a little bit of trivia, uh, we do not have a uh, image, like a, a photo of, of Dr. Parkinson. And in fact, for many years, and I, I'm, I'm guilty myself of having done that, uh, this gentleman was portrayed in various lectures and publication as Dr. James Parkinson. But as it turns out, he is not Dr. James Parkinson, but some other James Cumin Parkinson, who, as you can see, was born about 20 years after Dr. Parkinson uh, described Parkinson's disease. So even though it looks like a respectable doctor, it is not our uh, uh, Dr. Parkinson, whose only representation might come from uh, one of his books, The Alehouse Sermon, back in uh, 1804. And he probably, he's this gentleman on the left um, talking to these uh, uh, people in this, in this uh, uh, old uh, beer parlor. Uh, in England. Anyway, little curiosity, but let's move on. As we have already heard, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease is an enormous public health challenge. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's disease, affecting about 1% of the population over 65 years of age. And as Susan mentioned already, is the fastest growing among neurological 
diseases. Um, as you can see from this uh, <clears throat> graph, the number of patients with Parkinson's disease doubled from 1919 to 2015 and is uh, expected due in general for, uh, to the uh, general aging of our population to about uh, 18 million, so almost tripled by uh, 2040. So an enormous uh, uh, challenge uh, uh, in terms of resources for our um, um, uh, society. And you have already heard from Dr. Bronstein a lot about the uh, substantia nigra and the Lewy bodies. And so we can uh, uh, define uh, Parkinson's disease as a progressive chronic neurodegenerative disease with a slow and selective loss of dopaminergic neurons with accumulation of Lewy bodies, which Dr. Bronson already described as this uh, protein uh, clumps inside the brain cells uh, of the substantia nigra, this small area of the brain uh, that produces uh, the uh, dopamine. And um, uh, due to the fact that the lack of dopamine uh, defines a disease, a, a, a key point is the response to levodopa or to other type of dopaminergic supplementation. This is the current classical definition of Parkinson's disease. How do we diagnose it? How do we decide that, that someone has Parkinson's disease? Well, the diagnosis is basically a clinical diagnosis, and I brought you a little video that can sort of exemplify what we look at uh, in a neurological office when someone uh, might have Parkinson's disease. You see the shaking of the hands, what we call the resting tremor. You see a, a slowness of movements. This lady is trying to tap her foot, and now is trying to do what we call a finger to nose. You see how slow and tentative are her um, uh, movements. And then there is a third uh, sign. This is again, you can see the extreme slowness of her movements. Uh, and this is a third sign that which is an increase in the uh, stiffness of her muscles. And then you see also the postural instability, the lack of balance that is typical of Parkinson's disease. So. We need two of these three of these four symptoms: this, the shaking, the stiffness, the slowness, or the lack of balance. And you can see also this very slow uh, shuffling gait. This very very typical of Parkinson's disease. When we see these symptoms, typically affecting more one side of the other of the body, and associated with the typically an expressive uh, face, slow handwriting, soft voice. And again, a good response to, to the treatment with levodopa, we make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, which remains to date an essentially clinical diagnosis. However, things are not always so clear cut, like in the video that I show you. So we can use other uh, ways to uh, categorize Parkinson's disease. Uh, you have heard about some genetic uh, uh, mutations, genetic variances that can uh, predispose uh, uh, some individual to develop Parkinson's disease. There are some symptoms, and we'll get back to that uh, in a second, like poor smell, uh, uh, enacting uh, dreams, uh, constipation, depression that have been associated with the future development of Parkinson's disease. There are some uh, uh, biochemical tests, uh, uh, now we can do uh, biopsies of the skin that can find alpha synuclein and confirm a clinical impression of Parkinson's disease. But probably the most effective uh, diagnosis um, uh, that we have is the, um, the uh, imaging studies, uh, especially the DAT scan or dopamine scan that can show the actual decrease of uh, the dopamine in the brain. And so because of the complexity of, of the disease and the fact that it doesn't always appear exactly in the same way, we'll get back to this concept in a second, uh, combining all this uh, diagnostic biomarker is probably gonna help us to diagnose. And I'm gonna bring you another interesting uh, topic here. Uh, there are some uh, 
there's some evidence that dogs can actually uh, diagnose Parkinson's disease. This is uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Lori uh, Mishley up in uh, Seattle, who has trained uh, a number of dogs to recognize the scent of patients with Parkinson's disease. Yeah, I'm gonna let her speak so you can follow her uh, diagnosis. You see the dog stopping in front of the uh, cup containing Parkinson wax. So quite surprising, uh, you would agree with me. Um, we can diagnose, uh, uh, we may be able to decrease, to uh, diagnose Parkinson with uh, the help of some uh, um, um, uh, dogs. I apologize for the um, uh, noise. The reason why we may need uh, further diagnostic tricks, so to speak, is that we realize that Parkinson's disease is not only defined by movement problems, by the shaking, by the stiffness, by the slowness, uh, or the poor balance, but by a number, uh, many other symptoms that we now uh, recognize as a collective definition of non-motor symptoms. And as you can see from this uh, List. There are many of them. There are psychiatric, cognitive, um, uh, autonomic, blood pressure problems, gastrointestinal problem, urinary problem, uh, sleep disorders. Very important. A sensory problem, loss of smell, pain, altered sensation, and these are symptoms that are just as typical of Parkinson's disease as the uh, uh, neurological symptoms that I uh, described earlier. In fact, they occur very early in the disease. You can see on the left, a graph from a study showing that in patients with very early uh, uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, they had Parkinson's disease for only about six months. They already had on average about eight non-motor symptoms. So just imagine we have three or four motor symptoms and about eight non-motor symptoms right off the bat. So you can imagine the importance of these no motor symptoms, which increases as the disease progresses. And in fact, on the right side of the screen, you can see this graph that is from a study uh, from Australia on very advanced Parkinson disease. You see 15 years or longer uh, duration of Parkinson disease. And you see that the major disability after 50 years or more is from cognitive decline, from depression, from difficulty swallowing, uh, visual hallucinations, urinary problems, poor balance. Most, if not all of these uh, symptoms are non-motor. So what really affect, impact the quality of life of patient Parkinson's disease is more non-motor than motor. And this is very, very important because as we are heard already from uh, Dr. Bronstein, uh, the current understanding of Parkinson's disease uh, brings the uh, onset of the disease probably 10, 20 years before we note, we describe the typical neurological symptoms, the shaking, the stiffness, and the slowness. And the symptoms that supposedly uh, uh, precede or, or, or mark the very beginning of Parkinson's disease are all non-motor. 
So I tempted to say that maybe Parkinson's disease is a non-motor disorder more than the motor disorder. And three of these symptoms are particularly important. The loss of smell, the dream enacting behavior, basically acting out the dreams, and also uh, autonomic uh, symptoms like constipation. And just to give you an idea of how critical are the symptoms as non-specific as they might be, is that having just one of them is fairly benign. It increased the risk of Parkinson about five times. The risk of Parkinson is relatively low in the population. We said about 1%. So increasing five times is not trivial, but it's definitely not the end of the world. But look at if you have two of them, 33 times the chance. Look if you have three of those, 160 times the chance. And if you go on with four or five or six of these symptoms, the, the, the risk is so high that in my opinion, it's not even a risk anymore. It's just a matter of when the, the, the neurological um, problem would occur. And this sounds scary, but in reality is uh, a, a great uh, a beacon of hope because if we can start detecting the disease 20 years before it actually affects the brain with the, with the neurological symptoms, we have a tremendous window of opportunity to act upon it. And that beg the question, obviously, when do Parkinson's disease really start? And we most uh, 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 specialists now agree that probably it starts 10 to 20 years before what we now call Parkinson's disease, the bradykinesia, tremor, and rigidity that we use to diagnose it. And then uh, it, it, it raised another question. Given the uh, multiple uh, motor and non-motor symptoms, um, is there one Parkinson's disease or there are many Parkinson's disease? In other words, is Parkinson's disease one disease with many faces? Which one contributing to explain the difference between individuals? Or Parkinson's disease is many diseases that share some elements with that one another, but actually follow completely different lines of abnormalities. These are questions that for which we don't have an answer, but they are critical because um, when we, for example, study a new medication or a new treatment, uh, the idea that we may put together patients that have different diseases obviously creates uh, uh, a, a variability that would uh, kill the, the chance of, of learning pretty much anything from that clinical trial. So these are questions, again, that are not answered, but they're very, very intriguing, and uh, many, many uh, researchers are working on it. So in conclusion, Parkinson's disease is the fastest growing among neurological diseases, and the knowledge about it is also incre growing incredibly fast and is changing the approach that we have to the disease. We have the typical motor symptoms, slowness of movements, plus either tremor, arrest, or muscle stiffness. Later in the disease, also postural instability, lack of balance, and falling is a typical feature. Non-motor symptoms, if there is one take-home message, is that Parkinson's disease is not just shaking, but many other symptoms ranging from psychiatry. We will hear from Dr. Wertheimer about the risks of dementia in Parkinson's disease, autonomic problems, sensory loss, sleep disturbance is extremely important. They occur variably at different stages of the diseases and in different patients. Very importantly, Parkinson's disease may start several years before the onset of what we now call cardinal symptoms or Parkinson's disease, open a window of opportunity for early diagnosis and disease-modifying treatments. Parkinson's disease may be one disease with many faces or many diseases that share some elements with one another. Therefore, treatment can be extremely effective for both motor and some of the non-motor symptoms, as we will hear from Dr. Tan. I want to 
have a last um, slice to thank and acknowledge uh, my uh, group at Cedar sinai You see how many we are and we're growing year after year because from my brief presentation, you can understand that a multidisciplinary approach, we, def we need multiple expertise in order to truly uh, take care of the var variable and incredibly different and unique uh, uh, experience of patients with Parkinson's disease. Thank you for your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, that was fascinating. What what I learned was about the non-motor and how it can predispose getting Parkinson's, you know, 20 years before. So I have heard, and do you think it is true, if, if you're diagnosed with Parkinson's because you have motor symptoms and you're 83, is it true that because you're older that you may not get as symptomatic as someone may be diagnosed 20 years before? That is actually correct. Um, it is debated because um, uh, the, the older you get Parkinson's disease, if you read the literature, uh, um, it is said that, that the, the, the progression is actually faster. But the problem is that the way we uh, calculate or we evaluate the progression of the disease is based on falling and balance. There is a the great, obviously, uh, uh, value put on the uh, maintenance of balance in patients with Parkinson's disease. And if you're young, if you're in your 40s or your 50s, balance is usually not terribly affected by Parkinson's disease. But if you're in your 80s already, when balance is a problem, even if you don't have Parkinson's right. disease, the balance is usually affected earlier. So you will read that uh, a patient with Parkinson uh, that developed it in the 80s progressed faster. In reality, if we take the balance out of the picture for a second, the, the shaking and the, and, and the motor uh, uh, disability, it tends to be a little bit uh, uh, slower. Um, they, it, it's, it doesn't progress as fast. Uh, they, they don't develop much in terms of these kinesias as their uh, younger counterpart. But as I told them all the time, they have to be careful with the, with the balance because the risk of falling increases exponentially, uh, unfortunately, with increasing age. Oh, that's interesting. Well, thank you so much. And we'll have you come back for our uh, Q&A in a few minutes here. Um, and next, I am super excited to present Dr. Jeffrey Wertheimer. PhD. He is the Chief of Neuropsychology and Associate Director of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Cedar sinai He has 20 years of experience and specializes in clinical psychology and cognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms in Parkinson's. He works in the clinical programs with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, Neuropsychology, and Neurology. He completed a residency at the VA Healthcare System and University of Michigan and his fellowship at the Rehabilitation Institute of Michigan, Wayne State University. Dr. Wertheimer's research interests include movement disorders, the assessment and cognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms of Parkinson's and deep brain simulation outcomes. I'm super excited about that. Psychological adjustment and resilience in chronic, il chronic illness and inter professional collaboration. Jeffrey, if you could please join us. And Jeffrey made time out of his vacation with his family for this to help produce this webinar. So I want to thank your family in advance for that, for sharing you with us. And thank you so much. I'm just going to check my audio. Can you hear me? Oh, your audio is yes. good. Your audio is oh, good now. Thank you. I can hear you. All right. First off, Susan, thank you for the invitation as well. And it's a distinct pleasure to present with Dr. Bronstein, Dr. Taliati, and Dr. Tan. And in this case, you know, we were asked to present on a variety of important elements of Parkinson's disease. And to mention Parkinson's remains a top interest for many individuals. So we want to put that on the spotlight today. 
There are two main objectives. One is to introduce the concept of dementia, the diagnosis, et cetera. I think in order to understand dementia, it's also important to understand the broader landscape of cognitive changes for individuals with Parkinson's. So we will talk about cognitive changes even around the diagnosis of Parkinson's for some as it progresses into Parkinson's disease, mild cognitive impairment, and also the question at hand, what is Parkinson's disease dementia and how can we manage it? So in that regard, we will talk briefly about the therapeutic interventions as it relates to cognitive changes, both as there might be some neuroprotective elements of health styles, but also importantly, how do we adapt to cognitive changes? I like to underscore on the front end, as Dr. Taliati and Dr. Bronstein pointed out, my words are, this is a tapa style restaurant kind of presentation style of, this is a small portion of a very big topic. So while this is hopefully easy to digest, uh, there's a lot of information that I wanna relate to you, but it is just a snapshot of a broad topic. So with that, let's first kind of highlight the high level kind of conceptualization of cognitive changes in Parkinson's. So I'm almost gonna end, start the presentation the way I'm gonna end it later. I am a rehab neuropsychologist, so I like to do a lot of repetition as we learn the information as well. So I wanna highlight the prevalence of cognitive decline. And in this case, when we look at Parkinson's disease, when we look at Parkinson's disease more broadly, cognitive decline is around 84% of individuals who have Parkinson's disease. And we can break that down to at any given time of research, Mild cognitive impairment is around 25 to 30% in prevalence, and dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia's prevalence rate, is ranging between 24 and 31%. But importantly, as the disease progresses, the risk of cognitive changes increases, in fact, for a large portion of the population. So in this case, 50% of individuals may develop dementia around 10 years following a diagnosis, and even up to 80 to 90% of patients with Parkinson's disease with longer than 20 years have been found to develop dementia. And I'll provide a few more detail points to that over time. But the question is why, why is this topic so important? And I think many of us can, can appreciate cognitions related to every single one of us. And as Dr. Taliati nicely pointed out, the non-motor symptoms can be as disabling, even more disabling than some of the motor symptoms. So in this particular case, cognition has been you know, identified as one of the major symptoms that can result in a lot of disability, leading to poor outcomes in management of their health care, but also poor outcomes when it relates to quality of life. And of course, there's an economic burden that's coming to play here as well. Treatments, I'll highlight a couple of key points there. They're pharmacological treatments as well as behavioral intervention. I'm going to emphasize the latter and just briefly touch on the former. I know Dr. Tan will be discussing this as well. So let me go to this slide. This is a really important part when we're trying to understand cognition context. When using a biopsychosocial model, biological factors, psychological factors, and sociocultural factors to understanding human behavior, there are many factors within each of those domains that can contribute to cognitive change. Dr. Bronstein mentioned oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is highly influential in cognitive decline and normal aging, but is also directly related to other pathophysiological circumstances. We can look at other neurotransmitter system, system deficits, not just dopamine, but neuroadrenergic, neuroadrenergic, I can't even say that, excuse me, neuroadrenergic and cholinergic factors, medication effects, comorbidities such as acute infections, even sensory deficits and malnutrition, sensory deficits. Some people are thought to have cognitive change when it may be because their hearing is declining. As it relates to psychological factors, depression, anxiety, psychosis, substance use can all impact cognition as well. It's important to look at those because sometimes when you treat these psychiatric symptoms, cognition may actually improve for a subset of individuals. And of course, cultural factors. I do a lot of work with patients whose native language is not English, and many individuals are challenged to identify cognitive changes when we may not be able to assess in the context of their natural or native language. We have some skills of doing so, so we want to keep in mind cultural factors. Also cultural factors relevant to how many individuals may be comfortable talking about cognitive change. Some individuals may not want to go down that path. It's easier to talk about motor symptoms than it is the behind the scenes cognitive changes, so to speak. So we want to keep that in mind when we're understanding a person's clinical presentation of cognitive difficulties or their personal experience. 
So that is the pretext. I want to go through a brief overview of the broader landscape of cognitive changes for people with Parkinson's. So first, I want to ask you this question, actually several questions. How would you respond to these? Do any of these sound familiar to you? Have you ever gone into a room and forgotten why you went there? Have you ever misplaced on something you had in your hand just a few minutes ago? Keys? Glasses? Have you ever made a wrong turn or missed an intended street, even in a familiar location? I know this is incredibly rare, but have you ever forgotten your password? Not being able to come up with the right word? That word finding on the tip of the tongue phenomenon? Or even calling a friend or family member or coworker by the incorrect name? These could be alarming, but I also like to put this in context. Some of these cognitive difficulties are part of the normal everyday experience. But we also don't want to minimize. So as much as we don't want to over pathologize, we don't want to minimize some of these symptoms, particularly earlier in the disease course, because there are many cognitive difficulties that are directly related to a number of Parkinsonian factors. So I'd like to put some definitions at play here. So when we talk about cognition, what does that even mean? Well, when we want to diagnose cognitive difficulties, we want to look at the various functions of cognition one of which in Parkinson's disease is executive dysfunction. We commonly see challenges in thinking skills that may show up as initiation deficits, planning, organizing, challenges, the cognitive inflexibility, challenges with reasoning, maybe even challenges solving problems. Bradyphrenia, a fancy word for slowness of thought, is also a common symptom in Parkinson's disease. Another factor is attention and concentration. While basic attention is usually spared, more concentrated attention or holding on to information for a brief period of time becomes quite challenged for people with Parkinson's. And memory. I'm going to oversimplify this, but memory is broken down to commonly three different functions. I put it into a fourth category. The acquisition, getting information in, and coding is that processing of the information when we go to store it, and then we use the information that was stored, we retrieve it and put it into play. For Parkinson's patients or people with Parkinson's, we often see challenges in the acquisition to get information in and the retrieval with the proportion of deficits being greater for those two and better for the storage of information. We have language challenges, usually in the expressive elements of language, that word finding problem, the word retrieval, or we look at verbal fluency, the smoothness of speaking or, the re or pulling out words we're trying to find. And the last domain to reference is visual spatial or visual perceptual, how we process our visual environment. So we see patients sometimes with double vision, diplopia, that's kind of an eyeball, ocular motor factor. Then we see patients that don't process the environment as well. When they start to walk through a door frame or a tighter space, motor symptoms become more challenged, such as that slowness of gait or festinating of gait even. And that can be a visual perceptual problem. So I want to segue into a key term, the heterogeneity of the progression of cognitive impairment. This is a really key slide. It's a lot to process, but I'm going to simplify it. First and foremost, look at the, that vertical line of diagnosis. So around diagnosis, as is mentioned, individuals with Parkinson's may already experience cognitive change. Sometimes just their subjective report here, subjective cognitive decline, is commonplace around the diagnosis. And then it may develop over time to more Parkinson's disease, mild cognitive impairment. Here's a key point though, as the disease progresses and cognitive changes become more apparent, in the first three years, there might be apparent fluctuations where you might actually experience mild cognitive impairment, but then it may actually, at a further point in time, get assessed, i.e. three years later, and then be declared as normal, and then progress to mild cognitive impairment again and ultimately dementia. How does that happen? There are many reasons. Sometimes it's medication management. The cognitive changes can be there due to a number of factors. And when they're managed well medically, then we see the cognition improve. Sometimes it's sleep. Sometimes it's depression and anxiety. When those are managed, the cognitive symptoms that were clearly there may improve over time. So you may see this cognitive fluctuation occur when you're in the MCI phase. Then there's the progressive element of Parkinson's disease, mild cognitive impairment to Parkinson's disease, dementia, which again, you'll see in the next couple slides, that's a common pathway. 
and less common though does occur is more of a rapid progression of Parkinson's disease dementia. And there are certain risk factors for that, which we can discuss in our Q&A if we'd like, but I wanna highlight that is another course for a subset of individuals with Parkinson's disease. So when we think about subjective cognitive decline and mild cognitive impairment, I wanna highlight this as a neuropsychologist who specializes in understanding thinking skills. It's very important to understand not just the objective side, my assessment, but I'm really eager to know about the subjective experience for the individuals. A common question I get from the patients that I see are, you know, one is I wish I had explored these thoughts five years ago, 10 years ago, post around the time of diagnosis or earlier in the disease course, because there was a lot to say, but no one really emphasized it as earlier on the disease course. Well, as Dr. Taliati and Dr. Bronstein are highlighting, we're in a new era where 20 years ago, heavily focused on motor symptoms, that in the last decade or two decades, they're burgeoning research and understanding non-motor symptoms. So we understand the importance of the patient's report, the patient reported outcomes with their symptoms, as well as the comments from family or care partners um, that may be there to help give insight into one's presenting symptoms. But I highlight these in the front end. So one, understanding there's the perception of cognitive decline that is not supported by standardized cognitive tests, meaning there's not a decrement in cognition on testing, but the individuals may report some changes, which could be influenced by a number of factors as mentioned. When we get to a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, that diagnosis comes to be with three key points. Number one is gradual decline as reported by patient, as reported by informant or care partner, or observed through a clinician. The next bullet point you'll see here is really crucial. We need formal assessment to confirm whether mild cognitive impairment exists or not. And that's through a screening tool in the clinic, in your movement disorder clinic, if you will, or through formal neuropsychometric testing. And we also see here that subtle difficulties can occur in single domains or more multi-domain elements, that being executive functioning and memory, sometimes memory alone, sometimes executive functioning alone, et cetera. But I want to come back to that point I made about fluctuating elements of cognition. I have patients tell me a lot if I say, how is your cognitive processing doing? How is your thinking? How are your thinking skills? They might say, what hour of the day? What time of the day? Morning or night? Because there are fluctuations due to medication effects, sometimes due to fatigue, among other factors. But in longitudinal research, we have found that over time, take this study, for example, over a three-year period, there were about 25% of individuals who were cognitively compromised but stable. There was a subset of 41% of individuals that continued to progress in their decline. 15% actually improved but still were challenged. 19% fluctuated, but 18% reverted from, nor from part mild cognitive impairment to normal cognitive functioning, formalized through neuropsychometric testing. So there's a key point that might relate to some of you or as clinicians to some of our patients they might notice these changes. And a lot of that has to do with good management of medications, good management of their general Parkinsonian symptoms, as well as management of the non-motor symptoms that Dr. Taliati was referencing. So now we get to that key player, player, the dementia. In order to receive a diagnosis of dementia, you need to have impairment in two of those five domains I referenced earlier. So executive functioning plus memory difficulties, memory problems plus visual perceptual difficulties. Here's a key point. The cognitive changes have to be severe enough to affect everyday functioning independent of motor changes. So that's a key point that motor symptoms can cause functional challenge, but if you take into account the motor symptoms, but we also have difficulties with cognitive processing that render us unable of doing things, then we reach the dementia diagnosis element. Take, for example, I can't manage my finances because I'm not calculating things correctly. I might not be operating a motor vehicle because my cognition is compromised. Those are elements that warrant at least consideration for the diagnosis of, of dementia. All right, so this is a great concept, from, again, from Dr. Arslan's work. Uh, this is a nice summary of progression of dementia. So in, importantly, many people ask, well, when does the prevalence of dementia increase? Well, as mentioned previously, cognitive changes can happen in a variety of timeframes following diagnosis. But in this study, looking at longitudinal studies of sample sizes over 100 that look at prevalence and cumulative pre prevalence rates specifically on dementia, you'll see a trajectory that within year one to three, a subset of individuals actually meet criteria for dementia. 
Again, a small portion, but it has been found. Then year four to five, you might have in the, the percentage of 13, 17% to 28%, all the way up through year six. In year 10 to 12, we see an increased percentage of individuals who meet criteria for dementia, up to around 50%, sometimes more. And again, year 15, all the way up to year 20, you can see that trajectory start to increase, that beyond 20 years, there's a significant risk up to 83%, 90% of individuals meeting criteria for dementia. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. This is a question I often get as well. What's the difference between Parkinson's disease dementia and this Lewy body dementia that we hear about or dementia with Lewy bodies? Here's a quick snapshot. One, it's a challenging to differentiate the two because there's a lot of overlap in symptoms. Some question, are they distinct disorders? Some say yes, but there's a lot of controversy, except here's what we do know. That we know that the features of Lewy body dementia, as well as Parkinson's disease dementia, have a lot of overlap. Cognitive decline, yes. Fluctuating cognition as the disease progresses for Parkinson's and early in the disease process for Lewy bodies. Visual hallucinations, also present for both, but more so present for Lewy body pathology earlier on in the disease course. REM behavioral sleep disorder, and of course, Parkinsonism. Importantly, Parkinsonism is a must for Parkinson's disease dementia. But sometimes in diffuse, or in this case, uh, gooey body dementia, you might not have Parkinsonian symptoms as a predominant feature earlier on, which leads us to diagnostic differentials. If dementia occurs in the setting of established Parkinson's disease more than one year down the road, more likely Parkinson's disease dementia. But if dementia precedes or occurs concurrently or within the year of onset of Parkinsonism, in this case, DLB is a strong consideration or more likely. But as we know, as Parkinson's disease progresses, Lewy body pathology becomes more apparent, thus presenting very similarly to Lewy body dementia later in the disease course. So overall, DLB is generally more severe condition than Parkinson's disease dementia with regard to cognition and neuropsychiatric symptoms early in the disease, that first year post-symptom manifestation. So a few more slides to conclude here. Therapeutics, how do we manage cognitive change? There are a few key take-home points. Let's briefly talk pharmacologically, which I know Dr. Tan will address more so, but I just at least want to highlight it here. For mild cognitive impairment, the research is not very clear on what's efficacious, what's not. There hasn't been a lot of support of prescribing these medications for cognitive disturbance earlier on when cognitive difficulties start to manifest when they're not at the dementia phase. We have found though, with looking at the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society Evidence-Based Medicine Review, that for patients with dementia, there are certain medications that have been found to be useful, as you can see here, with rivastigmine being a predominant you know, intervention for dementia for Parkinson's patients. But beyond that pharmacological approach, because we are a society that leans heavily on that, of course, but what can we do on our own beyond just taking medications? And this is a lifestyle element. How do we engage in behaviors that may be conducive to managing cognitive change? Cognitive training, rehabilitation, can be very helpful, especially for mild cognitive impairment. As Dr. Bronstein pointed out, exercise, imperative for all of us, of course, for health, but from a disease modification or neuroprotective element, physical exercise has been found to be efficacious but as we are challenged with motor symptoms, we have to have some self-compassion. Physical exercise can be difficult, but engaging in some element of physical movement is really key throughout the disease duration. And there are non-invasive brain stimulation approaches that may help out in the short-term benefit for some cognitive difficulties. But again, this is a neurodegenerative condition, so we can anticipate cognitive decline to be progressive. But giving a little bit of statistics here, you can see cognitive rehabilitation, is helpful and has been proven to be helpful for certain subset of populations, particularly myocognitive impairment. What I want to underscore here is the dose response relationship, meaning we need to commit to cognitive rehabilitation, meaning two hours a week, three hours a week dedicated towards cognitive calisthenics, but that are meaningful to you. Working on compensatory strategies can be very fruitful for enhancing function. Those functional gains can help with cognitive processing. As it relates to dementia, cognitive rehabilitation is emphasizing not necessarily neuroplasticity, but more so emphasizing our compensatory techniques rather than internal 
coping skills, we often need to rely on external compensatory techniques and routine. So home safety, environmental structure are really key. I put out there too, because there's a lot of behavioral health changes, depression, anxiety, psychosis, meaning hallucinations that are often commonplace with dementia, impulsivity, among other risk factors. Working with a behavioral health specialist, psychiatrist, neuropsychologist, health psychologist can be really helpful in managing the social support system and techniques in using compensatory strategies. And also concluding here, we need to highlight the power of and the importance of the care partner, the caregiver, the family support system, emphasizing structure routine for them as well as their family members, using resources beyond the scope of today's presentation, but we have a wonderful support systems, great resources in the community uh, to help out with managing the course so you're not feeling alone. And also for the care partners, the family members, pursuing mental health, not just for the patient, but for themselves to manage the changes, to receive education and so forth. So a couple key take home points and we'll wrap up. As much as there is a complicated picture with Parkinson's disease, we know that health habits are crucial. Exercise, cognitive stimulation, managing nutrition, managing sleep, which is very difficult, but doing the best we can to aid, engage in sleep hygiene. Relationships, connectivity and mental health are all crucial to quality of life. So despite the complexity, these are still in our grasp. So I will conclude with these statements, kind of where I started high prevalence of cognitive impairment, particularly as the disease progresses. Ongoing research on an accurate classification of cognitive profiles is really important, particularly earlier. Earlier assessment and intervention can improve quality of life over the long term. Some cognitive difficulties can be modifiable, as mentioned. Rehabilitation techniques can aid in improving cognitive processing and daily function using education compensatory strategies. And lastly, as Dr. Tagliati highlighted, it takes a team and multidisciplinary team to manage the variety of symptoms can definitively help with cognitive processing as well. So with that, thank you for your time and attention. Um, that was incredible. And I'm so glad that you touched on the difference between why did I come in this room and what are these car keys and what do they mean? Uh, my father had Alzheimer's and that's when I really noticed a difference of normal aging and memory and the executive function. He went up to a microwave once and said, what, what is this thing? So I really appreciate that. And I also wanna highlight what Jeffrey said, and that is for everyone diagnosed with dementia, there's an average of five caregivers that are directly impacted. And you talk about the multidisciplinary approach. It really takes a team. Um, it takes a team with all these different brain diseases, Parkinson's, Lewy body, Alzheimer's, all under the uh, dementia. Uh, umbrella. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, next, and Echo has joined us. Thank you so much. Um, our last presenter is Dr. Echo Tan, an assistant professor of neurology at Cedar sinai She completed her neurology residency at the University of Southern California and movement disorder fellowship and training at Cedar sinai her research interests include wearable technology for the diagnosis and management of movement disorders, as well as advancements in deep brain simulation technology, stimulation, excuse me. Clinically, she's interested in the surgical management of movement disorders and the education of future mu movement disorder specialists. Echo, could you please join us? I think you're there and I really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for being with us on this um, Wednesday afternoon. Let me just share my slides. So today I'll be uh, talking about the uh, treatments available to us for Parkinson's disease. Primarily, I will be going over medications and also the, <coughs> excuse me, the surgical options available to patients. Um, there are many, many different approaches to Parkinson's disease treatment. I like to say, if you ask 10 different neurologists, you're gonna get 10 different opinions about which medication to start and what dose. Um, there is no strictly wrong answer. There is no strictly right answer. Um, but if you look on this little chart here, you will see on kind of like the first blue um, bar at the top, 
where you initiate medical therapy, that's usually where a lot of the neurologists start. And as you have more symptoms or you have progression or perhaps certain things don't work, then you start adding layers on top. But I'll pretty much cover everything on this slide, at least uh, briefly, if, at least if not just in passing. Okay. So the mainstay of treatment uh, used for 40 to 50 years and still to this day has not changed is carbidopa, levodopa. Some of it may, some of you may know it as Cinemet, others may know it as Ritari. There are different um, brands for it nowadays. It is still the gold standard uh, for treatment of Parkinson's disease. There is a concern, and I get this question a lot from patients, that you know, does it worsen progression? Does it speed up your symptoms? Um, and the answer is no. There have been many studies over the years that have proven that it doesn't worsen progression and it doesn't make any decline faster. There is a risk of dyskinesia with taking the medication, but we have found that the risk of dyskinesia is more about the dose that you're on and also about how long you have the Parkinson's, not just the fact of being on the medication. So the prevailing view in um, the treatment of Parkinson's today is just to not delay treatment and to use the lowest dose of levodopa that you need to treat your symptoms effectively. But there's no benefit in holding out and saving the levodopa until later. So as I said before, there are many different versions. You have immediate release, extended release. Um, there are sublingual tablets. Um, there's a new word, one not new anymore, Ritari. These are gel capsules. So there's a new, a new extended release, release formulation. It's kind of nice because most of it is extended release, but there is a little portion of it that's immediate release so that you can get the best of both worlds. Um, Divi is the newest carbidopa levodopa formulation. Um, it's the same exact chemical. There's not anything new, but it is fractionated. So for those people that take half a tablet, or so sometimes those that even break them down into quarters, uh, it's actually quarters already for you. So you don't have to do that on your own. And then another option that's kind of uh, taken in a different format, it's not swallowed is in Vrija and it's in Halen, so that it goes directly through the lung tissue and straight into the bloodstream instead of having to wait for your skin. Um, so again, like I said before, here on the left side of the screen, in Vrija, it's in Halen. It's more used for sudden off or difficulty turning on. Um, it's not something that you necessarily take on a regularly scheduled basis as the mainstay of treatment. And then on the right half of the screen, um, there is another form of carbidopa levodopa that's also not dependent on swallowing it. And this involves getting a, a tube um, surgically placed into your small intestine. It kind of looks like a feeding tube from the outside. And the medication is directly infused straight into the tube, straight into your small intestine. And it's um, another way of getting the medication into your body. And the benefit of this is that instead of having to take the medication like in two hours or every three hours, um, if you have on and off symptoms, it's a continuous infusion. So you get a more steady state of medication. Um, so I get this question a lot. I heard that levodopa stops working after five years. And um, this has been shown not to be true. Um, it's probably the one most one of the most uh, pervasive myths about Parkinson's disease treatment. I still have a lot of patients, and rightly so, who show up who are afraid of taking levodopa or the lactate too because of fear of using it up. Um, and we have proven that that's not true. It works for decades. It only works on certain things, and it does not treat everything. It's a lot of the non-motor symptoms it doesn't treat, so we have to approach those separately. But it does, it can um, reduce motor symptoms and has been shown to greatly improve health. So other treatment categories, I lumped dopamine agonists all onto one slide. There are many, many um, versions of it, uh, but there's Parmipexol, or uh, you may know it as Mirapex, um, Ropinerol, you may know it as Requip. Apomorphine, I'll go into a little bit more. Rotigotine is Nucro, that's the patch one. Um, there are certain advantages. These are 
extended release and that you may take them only once a day instead of the extended release probably about the levodopa which is still having to be taken multiple times a day it is a non-levodopa alternative for some patients who still prefer that um, who are early stage in their disease and who don't necessarily need levodopa and there is less of a disease as well there are drawbacks it has less of a robust effect there are certain side effects that can happen, so we do need to counsel patients appropriately. And then there can be some withdrawal symptoms if you decide to stop the medication. So definitely if you decide that the monogamists are not for you or not for your, for your, your, your family member, um, I wouldn't recommend stopping it for jerky. We definitely do can have to they can see, but still can be accomplished. Other treatments, there's been a lot of new medications in the last, I would say, five years, more so than in the 10 years prior. So there's been a lot of work in the pharma, um, pharmaceutical industry. I'm just going to name some of these um, that we kind of come up with. Norian, um, Ongentis, um, Bocovery, you may have heard of, Zodago, uh, Vesagiline, or Avalect. I kind of went over the dopamine agonists already. But in there, I wanted to cover um, apomorphine. Apomorphine is actually a very, very old drug. Uh, one of the first treatments available, actually, for um, Parkinson's disease as well. It's been mod it's been um, kind of brought back into the modern age um, as an injectable pen. So it's called apopin. So for if you have sudden off symptoms and you feel like that dose, next dose, is just not working just quite yet. You can use an injectable pen to inject yourself and to get more on some things within 10 or 15 minutes. And then for those who, and then the newer version of the same exact drug is called Kimnobi. It's a dissolvable strip that you put under your tongue. It also does the same thing. It helps turn, uh, turn on and helps you get you into your on state more quickly while you're still waiting for the medications to work. I just mentioned botulinum toxin that is another medical treatment for certain symptoms of Parkinson's disease. <coughs> Excuse me. It doesn't necessarily treat the stiffness or slowness or other kind of the most typical Parkinson's disease symptoms, but it can address certain um, other symptoms, other motor symptoms. So some patients have clenched fist. They have either clenched entirely or kind of half, half clenched like this. Um, botulinum toxin injection can address that. If you have curled toes or maybe your ankles turn in, some patients also have those problems as well that doesn't respond to medication. Um, that can address those kinds of problems that we call dystonia. Um, some patients have eye closing where they actually look like they're sleeping, but they're actually not sleeping because their eyes are not opening. Um, and we call that blepharospasm or iridopexia. And so you can actually use injections of botulinum toxin to help open up their eyes so that they can keep their eyes open during the day. They can still blink and they can still sleep, but it does help them keep their eyes open when they're choosing to keep their eyes open. Truncal dystonia, so also abnormal muscle movements in the trunk. So some patients are leaned over forward, and then some patients are leaned over to the side. Um, that can treat that as well. Um, if you go to urologist, overactive bladder is very common. And so perhaps you can um, be injected into the bladder for that. And then also drooling. A lot of patients complain about drooling and botulinum toxin can treat drooling. So a lot of different uses for botulinum toxin, not just wrinkles, um, not just migraine, uh, very useful treatment. And then in terms of non-motor symptoms and treatments for other non-motor symptoms, like Dr. Wortham has already mentioned, um, there are some uh, medications available to treat dementia. It's nothing that's unique to the Parkinson's world, unfortunately. They've all kind of been borrowed from the Alzheimer's space. So dimethazole, like stigma, they can offer a small amount of benefit for certain patients. So it's something that you should discuss with the doctor. And maybe discuss um, with the uh, And then I'll cover medications for hallucination. So uh, Parkinson's disease, hallucinations, and delusions. 
this is more common um, as we have more cognitive problems. Um, it can be present without um, significant cognitive problems, you know, but it is often associated with um, cognitive problems. They can be bothersome. Um, they can be non-bothersome. They may just start out non-bothersome. They may just see a shadow in the room that disappears, or they may see, and everyone does this, if you see a cloud, you can make shape out of the cloud. Um, it becomes a, becomes a little bit hair more uh, like that for, for certain Parkinson's disease patients because they're just faces and different things. Um, they start to see shadows, they can see um, kind of gray lesions on the sides of their vision. Um, they start to see some little bugs on the floor or maybe people or animals in the room. So when it gets to more form delusions, it can be more dangerous. It can erode relationships because sometimes um, caregivers and, and patients for them have a disagreement about what they're seeing and what's actually going on with the screen. So when it becomes bothersome, are uh, they like to treat these hallucinations? And some of the easiest things to do that even don't have to resort to medications are just things like redirection. You know, redirecting the conversation and just kind of moving on, keep going forward. Or even just simple as turning on the lights. These often happen more when it's dark in the room, where the light is really low, and there are lots of shadows being cast everywhere. So just turning on the light, make it really bright in the room, can often make this disappear. But if that's not enough, there are medications that can help. Patiapine is one. Clozapine is another one. And the newest one is Clopinavancer. And those can help treat the hallucinations and the So I want to move on to the surgical world. Uh, deep brain stimulation is probably the most popular surgery that we have for, Parkinson's, for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, the DDS. So when you ask who is the ideal patient for uh, deep brain stimulation surgery, am I a candidate for deep brain stimulation surgery? Um, ideally, the patient should be, between, should be between 40 to 75, though honestly, that's not a strict cut off. It's just a general recommendation because of the studies that have been performed proving that DDS does work. Um, you need to have Parkinson's disease and not something else like dementia in the body or multiple system atrophy. You need to have it for at least four years. Um, you need to have a good response to levodopa, proving and then proving that by showing that you have improvement of symptoms after you take medication, or you have to have what's called tremor predominant Parkinson's, where you have a lot of tremor in your tremors. So the goals are to of DBS are to treat your on and off symptoms, and then to also eliminate dyspnea. Those are the main two goals. So I get a lot of questions about what about my you know, balance? What about my memory? Um, unfortunately, those don't DBS doesn't really address things like that. It really addresses the symptoms that the medication um, addresses, but just getting rid of the on and off symptoms. And you do have to be cognitively intact. Um, because this is surgery requires general anesthesia, we are going into the brain. So we want to make sure that there are um, not bad outcomes that come of this and that we don't end up worse than we turn off. And obviously, you want to go over expectations about what you're going to get from a surgery. This does require follow-up. You need to come back to the neurologist to be programmed, to have it reprogrammed and adjusted um, to get the settings that we that we want idealistically. And so that kind of needs to go, we need to go over that. So this is just kind of like a, a visual representation of the on and off symptoms that I was talking about. So without DBS, patients are where are on the gray line. So you have off time at the bottom, and then you take your medication and then you do well and you're fine, but then you get disconnected. And then after a while, your medications wear off and then you kind of drop and then drop. Again, so with the yellow after the surgery, it becomes more mild. You may still have a little bit of on and off. Of obviously, the goal is a very, very straight line all the way across, right, and that kind of purplish on the zone where you're on without any troublesome dyskinesia. 
And then, so the goal is to get you into that zone as much as possible without having to dip into the blue and then without having to go into the blue. So this, these are just some examples. I want to play them simultaneously so that we don't, we're going on, so we don't waste too, we're not waste, but um, spend too much time. I want to keep up some time so that I know you have dinner to get to and things. So on the very far um, left, there is a patient with tremor. Actually, the first two uh, videos are patients with tremor. You can see it's pretty, pretty, pretty significant tremor. You can see how it would interfere with, with their daily lives. And then the last patient is a patient with shuffling. He's very, very short strides. It takes him a long time to get down the farm. And a lot of steps to make a turn. All right, so these are after DBS. So you can see the, um, the woman, her dinner is gone. Very nice and still, not slow at all. And also the gentleman in the middle, he actually turned on DBS on that little iPod right there. So you can turn it on and off yourself. And he turned himself on. And you can see within, I'd say, 20 to 15 seconds. And you can see the effect. And it's going to be a system. And then the last one, you can see his steps are much, much bigger, almost normal. He has good arm swing. He has a normal turn. One would never know if he's not going to be This is a, an example of um, the dyskinesias a patient would have with Parkinson's. You see those wiggling movements and have them in his, in his trunk and his orbit in his arms, his head. And he's crossing his feet because his feet tend to do it too. And then so after the video, he's the same time. You can see he's much more still. His, his walk. He's not just kinetic when he walks, he's nice and slow when he's sitting. And so this is those just are You can see now you can see he's walking down the hallway and he's a little bit swaying, his arms are moving. Um, and his walk is much better the BBS. So the BBS can get rid of these So moving on, this is another type of surgery, uh, surgical option available to Parkinson's disease. This is not new technology. This is an old uh, procedure, a thalamotomy. It's an old procedure done with newer equipment. It's done with ultrasound waves instead of gamma knife radiation. So this is a less invasive way of, of doing a similar surgery. Um, this is only for tremor. It so unfortunately will not treat um, the stiffness and the soreness. Um, that, that patients have, so you still have to take medications for that. And that is an outpatient procedure, and you say this is something that you can do with the patient system. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to cover, because I did see a couple questions beforehand in the pre-questions, um, that, and this is something that I get asked about probably at least five times a week, um, is the flow. And I'm hearing yet elusive, Parkinson's disease glove from Stanford. It was featured in the Today Show. I'm sure you can go online on, on YouTube or TikTok and see the Parkinson's glove. It was featured in a lot of, it's also in a lot of news articles and films. So there's been a couple of different varying studies, but the latest one that I found was there was about six patients who wore these gloves and there's a picture of it. On, on the right-hand side, uh, those, those are the gloves that we're talking about. 
Um, they wore these gloves for I think two hours at a time, twice a day. And then um, their motor performance was effect um, over six months. So right after they would wear the gloves for one month between the six months. So this kind of technology, they actually call it vibrotactile coordinated reset fingertips, fingertip stimulation. So the vibration is really at the fingertips. And so there is this theory, um, and Dr. Cass um, from Stanford talks about this, that um, there is this theory that we, there is abnormal synchronization of synapses or connections in the brain in, in Parkinson's. So when you have those abnormal synapses and they become ab ab synchronized in an abnormal way, this vibration kind of somehow short circuits that and it kind of stops the synchronization. Well, at least permanently or temporarily, probably permanently temporarily, we don't know yet. And so they think that induces sustained unlearning of what's called pathologic synaptic connectivity in the nerve system. So it's kind of stopping this abnormal circuitry. So all six patients did show improvement in motor scores of varying degrees, and they did test stiffness, soreness, and tremor. So now they're doing a bigger study. Hopefully, I mean, when they get this FDA approved, so it becomes, becomes available to patients. And they are including uh, Stanford currently. Um, this is the name of the study, Vibro Tactile Coordinated Reset for the Treatment of Advanced Parkinson's Disease. I think they're starting to recruit this summer or soon, I think. Um, so if you're interested, you, you would go to clinicaltrials.gov and you can search for those alerts. And I think you will be able to find um, the study and the project. I know a lot of patients have been asking about how they could become a part of the study or at least um, be able to get the gloves for themselves. But actually, this is not new technology. This is not a new idea. Vibration as a treatment for Parkinson's disease has been around since 1900s, actually 1892. So in 1892, um, Jean Martin Charcot, the same gentleman who described Parkinson's disease in the very beginning and named it Parkinson's, actually kind of came up with this idea to vibrate Parkinson's patients because there was a patient who told him that after they sat in a really long train ride or a really long carriage ride, their Parkinson's symptoms got better, at least temporarily after they got out. And so we kind of use that idea and create this vibrating chair to kind of see if vibration would be a treatment for Parkinson's disease. So over the years, over decades, they've done all sorts of different kinds of vibration treatments. They've done full body, trunkal vibrations, leg vibrations, just the feet, just the ankles, just the wrists, just the hands, just the fingertips to see if something can be done or something can be established as a treatment for Parkinson's disease. And there's a whole that I, I kind of took a deep dive into um, vibration treatments for Parkinson's disease in Google and it came with a lot of interesting things, a lot of interesting devices that have been um, created for this. But in the end of the day, uh, a lot of research still needs to be done to evaluate how much improvement you can get from these technologies, how sustained and, and how sustainable. Um, so this is my last slide. I only talked about the gray little hexagons, surgery medications, but there's still a lot of other things that are part of Parkinson's treatment, exercise, diet, speech therapy, physical therapy, um, and that a few small Thank you so much. I think the common message here is uh, modifiable uh, factors that we can all be doing to help our, our brains and probably our overall health. And those videos were so impressive. That made me tear up that someone could actually regain um, some horrible motor symptoms that they had from, from the disease. So thank you. And Jeffrey and Jeff and uh, McKelly, if you could join me. You know, most of the questions that were submitted from the audience and registration we have we have covered. 
but uh, I think there's a few that maybe warrant um, just a little bit more uh, conversation. And Jeff, I'm going to start with you on this. And it appears that most of the diagnosis are clinical, which means that they're subjective in nature and it takes a long time to come up with a final diagnosis. Do you have any uh, suggestions? This question's from Jane. Um, things that people can be doing at home um, before they can get in to see a neurologist, to get a baseline. Is there anything someone could be doing at home, taking notes or, or, or trying to uh, help um, when they get in to see a doctor that can be helpful? Yeah, I think, you know, the main thing um, from home is to maybe write down a list of some of the problems that you're having, uh, things that make it better, things that make it worse, when they occur, when they started, um, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, I think those are the primary things that they can um, uh, 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 think about. And you can also, if it's, you know, many of us have are backed up. I think everybody's movement disorder clinics are overwhelmed. We keep adding people. Uh, but a general neurologist is also a good place to start as well. Um, Good. I know. I know. I couldn't agree. I, I couldn't agree more. And and McKelly, I'll start with you on this. This is from Mary. And it says, aside from medication, do you have favorite methods to treat or get beyond depression or apathy for individuals with cognitive challenges? Uh, great question. Very challenging because apathy is a very difficult uh, uh, symptoms to, to address, which seems to be intimately uh, connected with the lack of dopamine in patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, you may be familiar with the concept that dopamine is sort of the, uh, the reward uh, chemical in the brain. And so not having the reward that makes the motivation to do uh, normally pleasurable activities uh, less strong. Uh, in general, we encourage uh, our patients to uh, work on their lifestyles and on activities that can uh, uh, help, uh, especially sleep. We work a lot on not only sleep hygiene or, or, or good sleep habits, like not try not to go to bed too late, to try not to uh, fall asleep with a, with a TV, with a, with a, with a light on, uh, but also make sure that the continuity of sleep is such that people don't wake up too many times, that they don't have a, a fragmented sleep. We also exercise regular exercise, which has shown specifically in Parkinson's disease to slow down the progression of the disease, but it's also known, this is a little bit of a TikTok type of message, the best antidepressant right um, in the world. So uh, regular exercise can positively um, affect mood. And I see Jeff, um, uh, Jeffrey uh, I, <laughs> smiling. So I want to see whether I left anything out in terms of maybe behavioral uh, uh, treatment for apathy and depression, Jeff. Yeah, wonderful comments. I would echo everything you said. I would only add, if we're not feeling the reward from the activity itself, an extra step that helps with the engagement piece is partnering up, is finding someone to engage in a task behavior. So if I don't feel motivated to exercise, I don't feel motivated to do an activity, if you can hold yourself accountable with a partner or with a support group, that is another way to get hopefully some satisfaction, but also the engagement in the activity that can ultimately be therapeutic. The other element I'd add in just briefly is sometimes we can't rely on our internal clocks to engage us when apathy and depression are really dominant. Those external cues become very important. Setting the calendars, using your own technology to set cues, and also again, trying to get partnership with those cues can be reinforcing as well. As it is really difficult, Dr. Talia, as you pointed out, but the partnership can be one separate vehicle uh, that can help at least in the execution of the activities. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that, if that's okay. I mean, obviously, I think agree 100% with with uh, what McKelly and Jeffrey said, but it's also important to realize that many people feel it's a weakness to get depressed, and it's not. It's a symptom of the disease, and it's due to a lack of dopamine and serotonin. And we also have medications 
that can be very, very effective, especially in combination with the behavioral things that were just spoken about there. It's very, very responsive to medication and these behavioral therapies. I couldn't agree more. And I encourage everyone to find some Parkinson's support groups because they can be incredibly helpful as well, because the isolation can certainly lead to sadness and depression. Um, uh, someone just wrote in, uh, Echo, I'll start with you. Any Anything on stem cell therapy? Um, there, there are ongoing trials for stem cell therapy. A stem cell therapy is a bit of a Pandora's box. We open it and there's so many different um, Things that you kind of have to figure out in terms of stem. There are different types of stem cells. Where do you put the stem cells? How many stem cells? Do you, is it just one time? Is it multiple times? So there's a lot of clinical trials going on and um, looking at all these different questions and stem cells. So we don't really quite have a good answer yet, but hopefully in the next several years, um, we will get an answer. If I can add a, a grain of salt. Um, Please. Stem cells is a very young science, very exciting, and uh, also very hyped by by media, but very young science. And uh, as Echo correctly pointed out, there are a lot of uh, clinical efforts in terms of experimentation, clinical trial. And so a very quick uh, way to distinguish between a serious clinical trial and a less serious clinical trials is the request for money. If mm. someone asks us for money to participate into research, there is something fishy because serious research, and Jeff is a, a master at this, uh, requires a lot of work from the researcher to provide the funding to uh, make the research available. And that implies convincing either government authorities or private uh, uh, funders that the research is actually uh, valid and, and, and it's worth the, uh, the financing and the investment. And so a patient should not be uh, asked to pay out of pocket. Whenever I see clinical trials that require $50,000 participation, um, I would immediately stop and 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 turn away. That's my personal uh, rule of thumb, and and I I I want to to know what other uh, on the panel may think. But this is very important because, unfortunately, especially advanced patients with Parkinson or without a neurodegenerative disorder, may be prey of desperation and 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 think that you know stem cells is the last. Uh, uh, resort, um, uh, but as 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 much as uh, stem cells is an incredible uh, uh, science that might bring us uh, amazing results, and already it's given amazing results in other fields of medicine. Um, I don't think that patients should contribute, especially with such high um, uh, amount of money to uh, to experimentation. I. Couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I feel extremely, uh, as strongly, I think, as you do, that these people all say that they're criminals. This is an unregulated field um, uh, for a variety of reasons. It's not regulated, and there's danger in doing this um, in addition to just uh, being taken advantage of. So please go on a nice vacation donate to a good uh, charity, but don't donate to a shyster that's taking advantage of vulnerable populations. Couldn't agree more. Donate to UCLA and Cedar sinai for their research. Um, so we've run out of time, but I just would like to ask everyone if you want the audience to take one takeaway, one thing they're going to remember tonight at dinner, because what Echo said is true, it's almost eight o'clock on the East Coast. But one takeaway, and, and uh, Jeffrey, if I could start with you. You're not alone. That this is a community. We've got great wisdom here with the panelists. You've got great providers out there, and you have a great community of support 
and there are resources that you might not be aware of. So please tap into the support systems, ask your doctors, tackle those resources and address those non-motor symptoms. And Echo? Oh, you're muted. Uh, keep reading, keep asking us questions. Uh, we, we enjoy knowing that you're well-read and thought about your, your symptoms and thought about, you know, uh, ways to come up with solutions and, and, and we love that. That's, that's how we keep moving forward. Um, be your own advocate. I'm just gonna add on to that. I agree hundred percent. Emma Kelly? On the very same line, uh, take charge. A diagnosis of Parkinson's disease as discouraging or, or, or negative as it might sound is, uh, is not the beginning of the end, but is the beginning of a new phase of a life that can be still extremely rewarding and successful. And uh, uh, taking charge means, in addition of uh, being informed, as Echo suggested, and looking for partnership and support, as Jeff suggested, uh, taking charge on your lifestyle. I'll always remind everybody that uh, Michael J. Fox, probably the single most famous patient with Parkinson's disease today, wrote a book when he, became, when he received the diagnosis, and he entitled The Lucky Man. So if uh, Michael J. Fox thought to be lucky to have Parkinson's disease, um, uh, uh, there is reason to take charge and not surrender to a, a negative diagnosis. And last but not least, Dr. Bronstein. Yeah, I couldn't be more hopeful for new treatments and disease modification or slowing and stopping the progression. There was a huge breakthrough this year in Alzheimer's disease. For the first time, we have uh, drugs that have started to slow uh, Alzheimer's down and uh, similar strategies and approaches are on the precipice. It's gonna happen. I can't tell you exactly when, but it's close and we're right there. So lots of reason for hope, not just in uh, slowing or stopping the disease, but also uh, new treatments to help the symptoms that people have now. So uh, in addition to what everybody else said, um, I, I think there's so many reasons for it to be hopeful and positive. And I'm gonna end with asking Jeffrey to say his, sentence that he just gave to me because I think it's a great way to end. But before that, I just want to thank all of you and thank our audience. And please share this webinar with friends and family. It's encouraging. It's encouraging. Go ahead, Jeffrey. We'll end with you. Dr. Taliati initiated it first, but I will say let's be life focused, not just symptom focused. Take care. Good night and be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.